Welcome back. You're still watching Fin Week Money Matters. Don't forget, this is the show that helps you manage your finances. Well, investors are following the mining and markets have been through the ringer when it comes to movements in this particular space. So if you look at just some of the, some of the share price movements, uh, the JSC's res resources top 10 has fallen 23% uh, since May, with companies like Glencore down 18%, uh, BHP Bulletin down 15%, and Anglo-American down 17%. But in studio with us, it took, to take a look at the outlook for this particular sector is Jason Muscat. He's, the, he's an economist and industry analyst at F&B. Jason, thanks for your time. So I asked Yana what the big issues were in mining. She said it's very much still a China story. Let's unpack that. Let's uh, look at the different factors. And yes, we're going to go back to China. How big of a factor is it? China's a massive factor. I mean, they are the primary uptaker of a lot of the commodities that South Africa produces and exports. And their growth has slowed from around 14% year on year to around 7%. Now, even 7% is not a bad number. But what we've seen in commodity prices, sort of halving of a lot of these prices, suggests that growth in China is... Uh, is worse than 7%. Mm. Um, other factors to consider though? I'll well, take your pick really. Uh, I mean, let's start with the US. Uh, absolutely. A rate, right, a rate hike definitely yeah. uh, coming and Fed that's going to have an impact. Yep, absolutely. Fed Chair Janet Yellen said that it uh, uh, looks like there's a rate hike on the cards in September. Um, so that's certainly going to put additional pressure on the commodity producers as well as China's growth. Um, domestically, we also have uh, significant challenges, load shedding being one of them. We've got uh, quite a fractious labor environment, and there's a lot of distrust uh, between labor, between government, and the private sector. And ultimately, where we are at the moment, there's, there's just no winners. Can I jump in there? I mean, with the rand at, what, was it 12 rand 75 before we came on air? Surely that does give us a little bit of a breather, though, from, from a South African producer perspective. One would assume that, because uh, when you translate back into rand, it makes the commodity prices uh, look a lot more attractive. Yeah. The problem is, though, that it's a double-edged sword in that, you know, the input prices also become a lot more expensive. So while the RAND has weakened, it hasn't done enough. You would hope that the commodity price, too, would lift. Um, so they are selling at the same uh, rate as before, but they're also seeing significant escalation in input costs. While we're seeing this uh, US dollar strengthen, let's take a look at some of these commodities and maybe starting off with gold, the gold producers. Sure. Uh, it's, it looks as though that 1,000 mark is coming or below 1,000 and it's coming very quickly. Uh, if we look at specific, um, uh, specific commodities, what is the outlook? And maybe are there ones that are in a worse, a far less off position than, let's say, the gold and platinum stocks? I wish I had a better answer for you, <laughs> but unfortunately there just seems to be nowhere to hide. Uh, let's, let's unpack platinum quite quickly. Mm -hmm. um, platinum is used in catalytic converters, and if we look at uh, vehicle sales in China and in Europe, um, they're starting to slow quite significantly. Domestically, we've got our own issues uh, in the vehicle market. So the demand for platinum is not there. We saw a six-month long strike where one would have anticipated that all that production being offline uh, commodity prices would have increased and that simply didn't happen. So there's a lot of excess inventory in the system at the moment. Um, you spoke about gold and uh, gold trading uh, at about 1088 uh, this morning. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a lot of pressure. A lot of these commodities have halved and you have additional constraints such as uh, producers, uh, low cost producers of iron ore just ramping up production. Um, and in an environment where commodity prices are taking such a hammering, you'd expect them to cut back on supply to try and raise the prices. But they're also trying to push low-cost uh, producers out of the market mm -hmm. at a time when uh, demand is just not there. And you know, even though we've seen commodity prices come off 50% uh, and more, we haven't necessarily seen the bottom. I think a lot depends on what's happening in China. And if we think about uh, commodity prices as potentially being a better reflection of the Chinese economy, mm -hmm. Uh, we can also look at what's happening in the, in the Chinese equity markets. I mean, we've seen an 8.5% sell-off uh, on certain days. Chinese government is starting to intervene. But all in all, the, the signs are negative. And unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be any immediate light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, Jana, just before you, you jump in there, you said we just have to look at the commodities uh, market and the performance of these companies uh, to see that China maybe is, is struggling. The numbers that have come out, is this just again solidifying that there is a contradiction between you know, GDP numbers that we get from China versus what is actually happening in that real economy? It's very difficult to say with any certainty. Um, the Chinese uh, government is very strong in terms of being able to stimulate 
economic growth. So they might set a target of 7% and then try and stimulate that growth through rate cuts, which is what they have been doing. The problem, though, is that commodity prices have fallen far faster and, and far deeper than uh, the economic growth rates suggest. Um, so to say that it is, is not a fair reflection of what's happening on the ground uh, is probably a bit of a stretch, but there does seem to be underlying weakness within that economy. And certainly the Chinese equity market is, is sort of reflecting that too. I think um, it's interesting because we always look at this from the point of view of China not buying our stuff or as much of it, you know, our commodities as they used to. But I think this, what's happening in the steel industry is showing an interesting side of the reverse of that, where suddenly they're sitting with all this excess steel capacity, for example, and you know, if you b believe the local steel makers dumping it here. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's going to be an interesting adjustment for the world economy to, to look at, at a, you know, to deal with a China that's no longer as dependent on infrastructure investment as it was maybe in the 2000s. So I think it's going to be an interesting time to see how it well all plays out. I think maybe out. just to pick up on that and, and throw it back to you, uh, Jason, we've seen trends in with particular companies cutting back on, on capital expenditure, steel industry saying they need more import uh, tariff support. Uh, Shell yesterday out with numbers, pulling back on capital expenditure, job cuts. Are they doing enough? I think they're doing the best they can in a very difficult environment. Uh, you certainly don't want to be investing in growth when there simply isn't a market for those, uh, for those commodities. And with oil sitting around $53 a barrel, we've seen a lot of the drilling guys take, uh, take production offline. Um, the drilling rigs have been uh, declining in the Gulf. So a lot of these uh, mines we see locally are being put on care and maintenance. Um, that's one way of trying to shelve uh, your capital expenditure. But more than that now, these mines are actively being sold off. Um, and that shows the depth of the problem. And obviously the, the repercussions for the South African economy are, are enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, I was looking at the numbers uh, a little earlier. Uh, in 1990, the South African mining industry employed about 800, 900,000 people. Sure. Today, it, uh, it employs just over 400,000. Mm -hmm. We spoke about the, the dependence that each miner potentially mm -hmm. has. So the knock-on effect is, is quite dramatic, and it feeds through into the manufacturing sector too. Now, in an environment like this, where we have a weak rand, ideally we'd be you know, expected to ramp up output so that we can continue to drive exports and bring foreign exchange into the country. Now, with the demand not being there, uh, we're not able to do that. And it's further compounded by some of the fractious labor issues that, that we're currently facing, gold mining uh, being one of them, and, and also load shedding, which has put severe restrictions on the productivity of these mines. They say that mining uh, moves in cycles. We in clearly in a downward <laughs> cycle. How much longer, in your personal opinion, and you know, obviously being an economist and an, an industry analyst and looking at this, how much more further do we have to go until there's some sort of recovery? That's, that's a very difficult, uh, difficult answer. And I think the key here is to watch out for what happens in the Chinese market. Will the Chinese government be effective enough in remedying what we see in terms of their you know, declining growth rate, um, and also more broadly, what's happening in, in India. India's uh, an economy where we are starting to see, you know, significant reforms, and we are hopeful that that starts to bolster, bolster their GDP growth. If that happens, uh, you know, we might start to see a bit more of a bottom in commodity prices as India starts to supplant China as, uh, as the uptake of, uh, of southern commodities. Um, that, however, is not necessarily going to be the case. China is an enormous economy. Um, India is still finding its feet very much a, a powerhouse in the making. Mm -hmm. yeah. No, I think uh, one of the points that I think Mark Stefani also made is if you can stick it out in the longer term, the prospects you know, of a consumer-driven economy in China is actually good for companies like, like Anglo, mm -hmm. where they have... Um, a big platinum and diamonds, you know, and, and those are things that they see demand growing in the future. But I think the, the key is going to be to see how companies cope with the next few months. Um, and I think Goldman Sachs in a recent report said, you know, companies are not doing enough in terms of asset closures and sales and retrenchments. And, and they expect that next, you know, by the end of the year, if things don't look up in terms of demand and pricing, that we'll see, we'll see substantial restructuring of, of companies early next year. So it will be an interesting space to watch. Yeah. Just the final one, um, the oil situation, oil price. A lot of factors here. We've got excess supply and the wild card, Iran, might, might come on stream. So this is going to add further pressure, you think? 
Absolutely. Um, they, they are a significant producer of oil. Uh, we've seen restrictions uh, being lifted after the nuclear deal was signed. They could bring additional capacity online as, as they need to start bringing money into their economy after years of isolation. And what that would do is so, sort of put further downward pressure on, uh, on, the, on the oil price. Now that's fantastic for South Africa. It might just be the reprieve that we need uh, in, in what is a very difficult economic environment. Um, but for people in the, the oil and gas industry, again, uh, that's going to put pressure on employment levels. Hard times, uh, leaving it on that very glim or that glum note. Thank you so much. Uh, this big thank you to Jason Muscat. He's the economist and industry analyst at FNB. And of course, Yana Murray, Fin Week's editor. That's it for this week's uh, Fin Week Money Matters. Remember that you can go get yourself a copy of the magazine and it's also available online. We'll see you again same time next week. Have a great weekend.